The trick may be not allowed to touch it. Okay, so we've heard a bit about indicators this morning, um, and my role in this is to, I'll touch a little bit on indicators themselves as well, but how do you translate those into decision criteria that people can make management decisions of? So it's really important that decisions be evidence-based, and that's for two basic reasons. One, to make sure that you're actually making intelligent moves. There's no point making a decision and then ignoring any evidence so they're kind of randomly wandering around. Unfortunately, some political decision processes do seem to work somewhat like that. But if you can say, yes, taking this action has this outcome, you're ultimately cost-saving because you're not wasting energy and monetary resources on things that aren't working. The other aspect is to do with psychology. It's called facilitation. As soon as there is the hint of corruption, people feel facilitated to not follow the rules. It's why zero tolerance policy on even very small acts of crime in places like New York has helped the overall crime statistics because as you go, as one of the best ways to help clean up a neighborhood is not just to paint babies' faces on the walls, um, but it's actually to clean up the place. So by putting pictures on the walls and, make, and picking up the litter and putting in garbage bins and taking those small steps, you're reinforcing the value of following the rules. So having transparency in your decision making helps people understand why that decision has happened and to follow the outcome of that decision. If you don't do that, you get into the kind of situation that I've experienced quite a lot in the coastal realm, which I call is the two-year-old model of sharing of coastal management. If it looks shiny and wonderful, if it's mine, if it's broken, it's yours. And that's actually how quite a lot of cross-jurisdictional problems come about. There's many different ways as scientists to help support the decision-making process. Uh, as you can see, I'm a mathematician, not an English specialist speller, so you have to ignore one of the I's in my multi-multi-criteria decision analysis. But the, uh, there's a few different approaches. There's the multi-criteria analysis, there's structured decision-making, there's management strategy evaluation. They're all ultimately dependent on decision theory. The difference between structured decision making and management strategy evaluation is kind of in the eye of the beholder, the person having the conversation. They can either be considered as two different parts of the same thing that you can do independently or link together, or in reality they're pretty much the same thing just under different names. The key part of it is that, it's very explosive this morning, isn't it? Uh, the key part of it is that there's these main steps to the cycle. First of all, you have to define your objectives. You have to define what the indicators are to tell you how you're approaching those objectives. What, what's your measure of change or your measure of position? How those compare to a reference point? They're your anchor points. So I have a little bit of discussion about how that's a problem under climate change. But the basic need is to have an anchor point so that you don't suffer what a good friend of Rashid's calls shifting baselines. So Daniel Paul has done quite a lot on shifting baselines and how subconsciously we just get acclimated to where we are and what we're doing. Our brain doesn't like having to make lots of decisions in a day. So it gets it chucks out the easy things that it can make into habit. And so it's one of the things it does is it just says now is as good as it's ever going to be or it has been it conditions everything versus the current state which means that through time and across generations you get a degradation so you need reference points to clearly tie yourself to desirable outcomes or, or things to avoid then you need to have the actions that you're going to test and look at and that's your first decision point you evaluate the outcomes of those decisions and then you use that evaluation to say, did that actions work the way we anticipated? Then you make the next set of decisions off that. So in the model-based world, we actually model all of these different steps. And we help them understand this set by testing out the model world, this step here. So we heard yesterday that there's no laws of social science. In our debate, there was a statement, there's no laws of social science and that people aren't predictable. Um, the double adaptive loop of learning turns up across so many disciplines and so much of decision making in the way that we do things that I think as social science matures, 
and it gets the right down its laws, the double adaptive loop is going to be one of those laws. You've got some of the power law relationships and ecology and that kind of stuff. So how do we go about making information useful to management? So this is a little story that Keith Sainsbury, a friend of mine, likes to tell, but there was a manager went up in a balloon, right? And he gets caught up in the clouds, and when he comes down, he's trying to figure out where he is. He sees someone on the ground, so he brings the balloon down as far as he can and says, where am I? And the person yells back, you're about 30 metres in the air, 5 degrees south, 35 degrees west. And the manager goes, Jesus, you must be a scientist. That's not helpful at all. That didn't help. I'm still lost. The person on the ground comes back, yeah, typical. I give you perfect information and you still fuck up and it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's because they each have the information content that they're expecting or they think is desirable, but it doesn't match between the two. You have to convert the very accurate information that you're worried about into something that they can interpret and make useful for their decision making. And a key part of that is making sure there's clear goals. So I'm pretty sure that at some point in your lifetime you'll get handed a very vague vision statement of we want to improve biodiversity. And as a scientist you go, actually the most biodiverse ecosystem is actually a shit ecosystem for different forms of bacteria, but I'm pretty sure that's not what I want. <laughs> So you have to translate that into meaningful goals. Okay, so the goals need to be set out in such a way that you can actually empirically measure them or they're not actually valuable at all. And so one way of doing that is to have the reference points as your goals and then the indicator as saying how well you're doing versus those goals. So you can't typically measure some of the things that people want out of an ecosystem exactly. So for instance, biodiversity is a great example. There's so many different ways of defining what biodiversity is that you can't empirically measure it easily. So you get correlative indices or something that gives you a hint of what the biodiversity is that you can more easily measure. So you have your indicator tracking through time and then you just see whether it's above or below the critical point that you're worried about. So for instance, in this one, you know, this part's bad in here and people would have to respond to it. The tricky part, and this has been the basis of quite a lot of adaptive management and biophysical management and even economics management around financial constraints, uh, interest rates, a lot of the reserve banks of the world go in there and try and keep interest rates around the desired target. The problem is it doesn't really cope very well with changing situations like uh, uh, climate change where the reference points might have to shift. Humans like to tag things to one spot. It doesn't mean it's the wrong way of doing things, we just have to about how we need to, want, need to be a bit more flexible about the way that we do it. So there's two types of indicators that people normally talk about. The biophysical world and the socio-economic world, there's an enormous number of status indicators where people track down one particular part of the system and say, is an indicator of the state. So they can be used for understanding, so how many fish are there, what are they doing versus the habitat, so you have the habitat and the fish indicators. They help understanding, but they're not good management indicators because you get an enormous laundry list of indicators. So I used to do a lot of work in the indicator world, and to be perfectly blunt, I got pissed off with it about 10 years ago and left because they just weren't doing anything. They were just coming up with more and more indicators and not making them useful for management. The management side of indicators is you need to map the indicator or the process to the objective of interest. And that's the step that people are failing at. They find it very hard to do that mapping. And so they don't come up with useful indicators. The, the key part of that is making it indicators that people will actually want to use. So including the end users in defining what are useful indicators sort of seems like an antithesis to people who want to be objective and say this is the most information content. But even if it's an imperfect indicator, if it's close enough and they make sensible decisions on the back of it, it's better than having a perfect indicator that nobody ever uses. Okay. So indicators that are useful, tend, it's, these are the best qualities. Some of these you have to give a little bit in finding ones that people will use, but the best qualities are that, that they're accurate and they're consistent, so that you know that they're reliable. 
but they expose trade-offs. So a lot of a problem with using combined indices is that they hide the trade-offs inside them. So you can't pack them, you can't take the different views between, say, the economic value and the social value and the biological status. By packing it all into one, it hides that. It's better to expose the trade-offs and make them explicit. You need to be clear about the uncertainty because if people think that they're making a definite decision upon this hard, hard data point, they get a bit of a shock when they suddenly find out it could be anything from here to here. Okay? So they often want just a single value and they'll try and push you to have a single value, but it's actually not useful in the long run to hide the uncertainty in the system. It also linked to the trade-offs. It's good if you can have an indicator that can generate discussion. So, if they all agree, that's great, but they should have an intelligent discussion around getting into that. So again, if it's overly packed and overly hidden and they can't have that discussion, it's also not in the long term being of much service. The key part of it is also in linking, I should have reorganised this and talked about those together, and then there's uncertainty one here, but let's just jump backwards and forward. Uh, the uncertainty part is also, it's helpful if you can have an indicator that tells you what the missing information is, so that you can prioritise future information. It might be that we can make an uncertain decision here, but it would be really helpful if we have this extra piece of information, information to supplement us as we're going forward. So it helps not only in the current decision, but highlight what would make a better decision in the future. And lastly, it's really useful if they can help communicate why they need to make the decision. So people involving people in deciding what those decisions are can really improve or if they can see why the decision is happening, they're more likely to buy on board. Now, it's not 100% guarantee. If it's completely contrary to their world views, they'll have barriers, as we heard yesterday. But if they can see what the logic is behind it, it improves the chance that they're going to go along with the decision. So in doing this, the choice of indicators is pretty important. So the easiest and most reliable indicators that you can communicate well and get rid of uncertainty and confusion between people are ones that have a linear connection between the indicator and the thing you're actually interested in. Because then you know if you're down here, you're definitely in this state. If you're over here, you're definitely in that state. If you're in this situation here, if you get a low value, where am I? That's confusing. So it's best not to use indicators for that kind of form. So then you get to the aspects of the indicators themselves that help them be more easily translated to decision critique. If they're easily measured and understood, that means that they're easily done repeatedly and transparently. If they're sensitive to the relationship, it's, you know, there's no point having an indicator that never responds to the pressure that you're putting in under. They've got to be comprehensive to cover the different aspects you want to worry about, but they also need to be concise. So an example of this is in the Bering Sea, where they every year compile an indicators report for the ecosystem. It's 270 pages long, and I pretty much guarantee no one really reads it. They glance through it, people will make decisions, the scientists, who, the one scientist who pulls all that together, gives the presentation a year, and sort of gives the summary highlights, and it's the summary highlights that people actually listen Okay, so it's the, while they're being concise, it's actually the last bit that people listen to. It's also best if they're direct, you know, that there's not extra steps in the chain that people have to do themselves to get them over the line. And that's also the part about being easy to interpret. So humans are fundamentally a psychologically lazy species. The harder you make it for them to use something, the less they're going to do it. You've got to just make it direct and easy for them to pick up. On the communication side of things, even that is something that needs to change through time. So I come from a culture, my grandfather was a coal miner, my great-grandfather was a coal miner in Australia and England, there's a lot of coal miners. And in the past, the canary was a way that you could do air sensitivity in a coal mine. Okay, so if the canary, this weak little thing died, got bad air, it would die. Now, a lot of you have probably heard of the expression of canary in a coal mine, but potentially not everybody, because it is actually a culturally dependent expression. If you're not from a country with coal mines, and particularly if you're less than the age of 30, you typically look at me straight and go, what? It's not a useful indicator, a way of communicating an idea anymore. 
Whereas this kind of indicator is universal across nearly all of human culture, not 100% of human cultures, but nearly all, to the point that in the far west of Australia, where they get a lot of itinerant workers and recreational people coming to visit, who don't have English as their first language, when you go into the hospital, they hand you a chart and you point to sad face, middle face, happy face, you, there's a chart of faces and you point to the one that you most feel like now. And that's how they triage you. If you've got lots of blood spurting and sad face, you go first. If you look mildly uncomfortable and have happy face, then you go last. But it's, me, it's a way that they've got of communicating easily with people that they don't share a language. So there's multiple objectives that you have to meet when you're dealing with a social ecological system, which means there's multiple criteria and multiple indicators. And it's hard because the targets don't line up and it's usually a mess of different directions. So how do you go about combining that to get the concise information? So there's obviously the first step is to say, well, there's some essential properties that we must have and then some desirable properties that come along second best. But the combining is actually really difficult because it has to be transparent, number one, so that it's repeatable and so avoid conflict because people will have different things that they've got behind them that they want to do. So that's where weightings come in. And sometimes you can easily weight that there's some fundamental properties that are so important they must overrule or else. But typically it's a very subjective process that different people have different weightings. So sometimes you just have to present multiple different versions of that weighted combination based on whether... So I published a paper recently where we had a discount factor that the economist agreed with, even if she's gone to sleep or me before or anything. Um, but we also published exactly the same indicators with no discount. Because the ecologist in us just found reprehensible that it was leading us to this catch all the fish now was the answer if you put in the economist discount factor. Whereas for the ecologist, it was the far future that was the valuable state we wanted to see. But we couldn't get it in through review without a discount factor, so we had to present both. So getting agreement can sometimes be really tricky, but if you can get agreement, it does tend to increase, again, the, the agreement between the different parties that this is something to support. So the tricky part about composites is that they hide things. So this is, I'm not having a go at the Ocean Health Index, it's a good effort. Um, I'm just highlighting that it is one of the kinds of indices that suffers from this kind of issue. So for instance, this is the Global Health Index at a sort of an EZ level. So if we just pick on Southeast Asia for a second, so in this one it's sort of this yellowy in-between colour where um, Red is a bad end of the score and blue is a good end of the score, so Southeast Asia comes up as yellow. Oh. Just fast forward through the whole time, that's useful. Um, you can see that when you start to bring out the different features, you get lots of different answers. So under biodiversity, it's a very biodiverse region at the present moment. Under tourism recreation, it's under a lot of stress. Under food provision, it's doing okay. So depending on what you're actually interested in, that overall score wasn't that particularly useful. So you have to dig down and, and dig out the different components. The key part of this is that every step in defining your objectives and getting indicators that people agree to, to figuring out how the weight is, each step of that is a long and lengthy discussion which can feel incredibly tedious, but is actually very, very important. So when I first started interacting with social scientists, as a biophysical scientist, it used to send me completely loopy. Like, I was so annoyed when they'd say, it's not the end result, it's the journey that's important. I'd be like, fuck you, there's only one answer. How can the point we get there really matter? But having now sat through these discussions all, quite a number of times, it is the journey that is important. <laughs> How you get there, taking everyone with you so that they can see what, why you got there in the end, not just suddenly leapfrogging to the end, is actually one of the most important parts of the process. The payoff of going through those long discussions is that it's focused on decision relevant information. What seems like a brilliant idea to us is usually really not useful to the manager on the day to day process. Uh, there's large numbers of complex options that you can then consistently go through. So it's not dependent on who's in the room and their subjective values. You can actually lay out a very clear process that anybody can repeatedly follow. 
It also means that this transparency and the prior agreement in the process means that what you'll find is that even that they get consensus decisions, they may not be happy with the decision, but because they've agreed to the process that it will happen in and they've stepped through that process, they can see what that decision outcome is and they will support it or give at least some support rather than openly try and undermine it. So this combination of things is important, particularly making sure it's decision relevant because as Chris highlighted the other day, and I've had direct experience, a new management decision crops up. What does the manager do? Well, typically he'll look up Google first, and then he'll call a friend. Then he might ask his friend who would be someone to talk to. He never thinks to look in the report that you did only three years ago and spent you know, many nights of hard sweat and toil writing up. Okay? So it has to be something that's in his head that he's going to immediately associate with going to look at. So this is where, but science can still inform the process um, by helping to define where these points are. So you've got desirable points, which are your, ref your, your target reference points, and then you've got your undesirable points, which are your limit reference points. And quite often it's actually easier to define where you don't want to be than where you do want to be. So there's no desirable, perfect state for the human brain, for instance. So emotionally and psychology, psychologically. But we can define when it's gone sadly, sadly wrong. And that's an example where there's no target state, but there's lots of limit states that you want to avoid. You can also, by doing it this way, you can have indicators that are binary, categorical, trend. So you can say, yes, no, we're there or not. We're close, we're far away. You can have quantitative values too, but you can also have trends. We're approaching it or we're going away from it which gives you a lot more flexibility given the uncertainty that we don't know how to measure some of the ecosystem services. We don't know how to report on some of the other features of ecosystems and, and human systems. But we can say whether it's heading in a desirable fashion or not. So that's the idea behind this. So you have sort of your unimpacted, which largely we cannot observe now. Then you have what you want. You've got, oh, it's not looking good, and then no, don't go there. So you've got in reference directions that are desirable. And in some cases, and this is the fundamental um, tension between biodiversity and fishery science, for instance, is sometimes your desirable state is a more depleted state. And so that's why fishery scientists conflict quite often with biodiversity scientists who have their, their target point is much higher. So they're all, the, the biodiversity scientists are pushing in this direction, whereas the fishery scientists are pushing back the other way. A key part of taking an indicator to a decision criteria, though, is understanding what's, like, what's called a dose response. So when I make an action, how does it change the indicator? How are they functionally related to each other? So like I said, the most desirable one is a linear connection. But you can also have other shapes too. One where if you take an action, initially you get quite high gains and then it starts to tail off. Or one where you have to do a lot before you actually see something. As long as you understand those shapes, they're not bad shapes, they have their pros and cons, sometimes around cost, um, but as long as you understand them, it's okay. So how do you get these shapes? How do you get to some of the reference points as well? Well, that's, sometimes you just have to do what in Australia is called suck it and see. If you want to suck, it'll work, no, I don't like that, well, they try again for something else. Um, it's that kind of idea of try it out with the information you've got available. So, for instance, getting back to the desirable and undesirable states, you might have a time series through time or through space and say, actually, we like that one. Or we've seen a catastrophic failure when the system gets like that. So you start to use those as your interim reference points. You might not understand the theory, you might not understand all this part, the response functions yet, but you can at least say, based on available data, places to aim for until you tie stuff down. So this is an example um, from Jamil Samori's work. He's done a, a heap of work on this, which is really great. So basically, um, you have the functional relationship that you're after. So you can have it in theory. If, if it's well enough understood, a theoretical relationship is perfectly fine. We can start to use time series data, either through time or through space. So you might have a case where you have a time series where you know that the human pressure, for instance, or the environmental conditions have changed through time, and so you've got a baseline value that you actually think is probably desirable, and you can compare your current value to it, and then where the, the 
change happens, you can say, well, that's the level of human pressure that we want to avoid. We want to be more like human pressure up here. Similarly, you can have a human pressure across a set of spatial sites and look at what the outcome is in your indicator and say, okay, you know, this is what we want to aim for and at what kind of pressure can we avoid that outcome. So you use differential pressure either through space or time to try and help you define where your thresholds and reference points should be. And this is an example from the North Sea. We don't, they did many, many indicators, but these are just two examples where through time, um, it's a little bit less clear, but you can sort of see there's a cloud of points up here and a cloud of points down there for the size of the fish. So you can say that there's a transition point in the middle. It's much clearer spatially in the North Sea that over a human gradient pressure from low to high pressure that you get a shift in the size of the fish. They looked at biodiversity indicators. There's another example where there's a much clearer change through time in the biodiversity values. Though spatially right now, that difference is so sometimes you have to use a combination of the two to start to piece out the information that you need. So once you understand these relationships, you then say, is it a linear relationship? Phew, that was easy, right here. Um, okay, so do we know what the desirable thing is from here? See how it's all about humans at this point? Humans decide what's desirable in an ecosystem, not the ecosystem. Ecosystems happily just puff along without us in whatever state they end up. It's us that decides whether it's desirable or not. So is there a legal or social norm about what we want? Yes, that's great. We can define the target straight away. If there's not, you have to go through more of a time series comparison where people agree or disagree to parts of it. If it's not a linear connection between the pressure and the outcome, that's a lot more painful. If there's none, then you keep trying to do this loop. But if there is a clear relationship, you sort of actually hope for a threshold relationship because that's much clearer. Yes, we can go to there, we stop there, that's our limit reference point. Beyond that, it's not desirable. Optimum, though, has its place in certain situations where you're trying to aim for up here. So then it becomes a direction of change. Am I heading towards that point? Yes, that's desirable. Because you can't really comment on the, the, the long run. And that's actually what's being used quite a lot, that direction of change is being used quite a lot in fisheries. So this is an example from Alida Bundy's work where she was just looking at um, whether it was improving, not improving, deteriorating. So what was the direction of, she had a bucket load of indicators and just looked at the direction of change of all of those indicators to try and figure out how different ecosystems around the world were comparing in an ecosystem assessment. Uh, Yun Shin, has, who was working with Alda, also did it just for light fishing and heavy fishing across indicators to see what kinds of signals you'd expect in different kinds of indicators to, to say whether you're in a good condition. The tricky part about indicators, whether you're using reference directions or reference points, is that they're system specific in actuality. So while in economics um, and fisheries theory at a species level, they try to set hard reference points that are held universally for all countries or for all species, you can't do that with an ecosystem. It's really system specific. So this is an example from some work we did in Australia where it was actually diversity they were interested in but we couldn't directly measure, so that's across the bottom. And lobster biomass turned out to be a really good indicator of diversity. Unfortunately, uh, it was different in different locations. So in one location it was a very positive, you know, it was positively related, so the more lobster biomass, the more biodiversity you had. 300 kilometres away it was negatively related. And it had to do with the way that the different reefs actually functioned. And initially when this came out of the model, everybody just looked at me and said, Beth, you fucked up. What did you do wrong in your model? You got that stupid result. And then we went and talked to people who actually live and work in those locations and it was actually what was happening in those locations. So it drove home to our managers that on the scale of 300 kilometres, so going from Tasmania to Victoria, so across that little bit of water, fundamentally changed the indicators and even the reference directions that made sense. Now the problem is that's one management zone in Australia. So it creates problems when the, the degree of ecosystem sensitivity is less than the resolution of the management zone. So the other part of it then is to understand how your indicators fit into your management rule and decision process. So you have an indicator at a reference point, is it above the reference point? Yes, you do one action, if it's not, then you do another action. 
So you need to understand how it all chains together. How do you collect the information? How do you assess it? What are the protocols around repeating that assessment to make, make sure we're consistent through time? What are the clearly stated decision rules? Not a political process of arguing who's got the biggest funding capacity to pay someone off, who's the loudest and whinges, whiners, complainers. Um, but having a pre-agreed set of decisions. So when you get this answer, these are the steps you have to go through. These are the actions you have to take. That's actually fundamental to getting progress in this kind of area. Then you look at how you actually, what are the specific <coughs> management actions that you take. So that's when you actually, so I do a lot of simulation testing and management rules to see if that combination of things has any flaws in it that can lead to perverse outcomes. So unexpected outcomes or places where it can all go terribly wrong. So you're actually looking at the combined performance of the monitoring, the indicator, and the rule set all together. And the reason that's really important is because even very precise indicators are useless if they don't actually lead to useful indices because they have a poor rule associated with them. On the flip side, a, you know, a less than great indicator will function okay if the decision rule around it can actually cope with that. So it's important to understand the whole set together. This is an example from Australia around a, a harbour that's regularly dredged and they wanna, they're worried about the effect on the benthic animals in the area. So every year they go and sample the benthos and look at the amount of smothering from sediments. Then they look at what percentage of the colonies are affected. And then, I apologise for anyone who's colourblind in the room, they use a rainbow scale. There hasn't been much discussion about that in some of the meetings. But if they fall in this outer green band, they don't have to do anything. Everything's fine. If they fall in this blue, blue band, it's a little bit less certain, so they need to get some expert information on what that actually means. Was there a particular flood event that year that brought more sediment down the river so it wasn't really dredging? Have the current shifted? Is it in what was the wind pattern doing? So they actively seek out more information. If it's in the yellow zone, it goes to a review panel and says, okay, what are we gonna do? It's heading in the wrong direction. We don't have to act to stop dredging right now, but we need to do something to curtail the problems we're having. So they start sort of a longer term management step. If they turn up in the red zone, that's it. They immediately have to act in a specific way if there's no questions asked. So it's a very clear process that everybody's already agreed to, so it takes out that political tension. And that's it. <laughs>